Hello and welcome everyone to this episode of Double DM Podcast, where we today talk about the process of especially creating our worlds for our games. Where do we start? How do we make sure that we create immersive worlds, all of that stuff. So you can create your own worlds and world build in a better and maybe new way. But first, Niels is back from vacation. How was your vacation? It was amazing. It was a blast from the past, basically, a trip down Nostalgia Lane. I was on a Greek island where I was when I was little nearly every year, sometimes even more than once. And the beauty of it is nothing really changed but it only got more modern. But the there are still the same stores owned by the same people and just overall the same vibe, but a bit more modern. Just mm -hmm. 12 years into the future, basically. <clears throat> That was just, yeah, I, I was just right back into this feeling of, yeah, no worries here, everything's fine, blah, blah, blah. Just hanging out and having a nice, nice time. And now you've returned to the crushing weight of reality, of exams coming up, of having to do work, to earn money, to live, to do mm -hmm. podcasts with me mm -hmm. no no that's an amazing thing that's a that's something i always look forward to but the rest exams and work uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fun stuff to look forward to anyways i still have two days of vacation basically I left for uh, from work Ooh. so that's good i just have to go to university tomorrow uh, hey. yeah. <laughs> i feel you three more mandatory laboratory days and then i'm done with the laboratory for this semester. Nice. I also have to go to university tomorrow. I also was today. Today was fun. Okay, tell me about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's only 11.30 a.m. But Niels, riddle me this. Oh boy. There is a person that didn't sleep. Who is it? Okay, let me think. Um, <laughs> does this person study IT? Yes. <laughs> does this person have a podcast? <laughs> Does the person's name start with an E? Yes. Is it you? Could it be you? Maybe. <laughs> I'm not I'm not happy about it, but I just <laughs> didn't sleep. I didn't sleep because of not because I didn't want to or because I well it was because I couldn't sleep. Because Wednesdays, since we were recording on Thursdays, Wednesdays are the days I do kendo practice in the evenings, right? Mm -hmm. Currently Berlin is in extensive heat. I melt. Literally. Mm -hmm. I sweat so fucking much. But then also going to kendo practice. And kendo isn't just a sport you like soccer. Kendo is a sport done in full gear. So first of all, we have a uh, way thicker clothing than normal sports clothing to even wear be beneath our armor. So we're protected. Mm -hmm. So you have this thick cotton vest, vest that is already soaked when you even just put it on with sweat mm -hmm. and then you have to put on like i think four five six kilograms of armor mm -hmm. sounds like fun in the weather like since you have a helmet on you don't necessarily get to breathe as much and sweat is dripping down your face in every direction and to places where you never thought that you could even sweat yeah one thing i will say training in this heat is at the same time the worst and at the same time the best. Okay, how? It's the worst because you sweat as fuck, you're tired, you're exhausted. And since we're wearing helmets, we can't necessarily drink that well. Mm -hmm. But the feeling of having finished that three-hour workout, that three-hour session, is unbeatable. Okay, I can get that. Knowing that you've done this. And now the thing about Kendo, right, is normally something like this never gets said in Kendo. It's obviously assumed, but you're never told. Like, for example, one thing in Kendo, um, when I started Kendo, we've since uh, gotten a little bit more lenient with it, is you weren't allowed to have drinking breaks while Kendo practice. Mm -hmm. Because you have, a, you have a helmet on, you cannot drink, right? And and when as soon as we put the helmets on, we don't drink. But before that, we have some more uh, lenient training sessions uh, for beginners. Those beginners 
beginners weren't allowed to drink a few years ago. Now they are, obviously, right? The thing is, we can't stop you from drinking because drinking is literally something you do to survive. Mm -hmm. But normally, right, as it's a very disciplined sport, you're supp not supposed to drink and stuff. Um, normally, our trainer never says this, but last time or yesterday, he said, if for whatever reason, you cannot do it anymore, you're exhausted and you know, uh, I, I don't want to push myself over the edge. Take it off. It's okay. We understand. We never, no one will force you here to do it, right? This is normally assumed. But mm -hmm. it being said, it felt just different because it was too hot. It was too much. But none of us quit. We all stayed through it. And that is amazing. And yeah. yeah. Oh, God, I sound like some kind of another white boy with a podcast. I won't sell <laughs> crypto scams. Don't worry, people. But I just sound like like white, like a, like the general white guy talking about sports and how you need to push yourself among boundaries, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I genuinely get what you mean. Just after a training session. A after... real man would push himself further and <laughs> further, bro. Buy my protein powder, bro. <laughs> no, but I totally get that. Because just after having done this and bested basically this situation and then talking with your fellow sports people about it is just, it just feels good because you're, you're completely done and exhausted, but in a good way. And that's one of the best feelings that you can have. In... Yeah, it... Especially, right, because everyone made it through. No yeah. one quit. We finally finished. We, we change clothing, right? We go outside into the fresh air and then sit there mostly and maybe drink a bit of something. Someone, this time our trainer brought something to drink. Yeah, just sitting there as everyone and then, right, talking about what we did. This time, it really, the feeling just was, damn, we all made it. However, unfortunate circumstances, I have been hurt a lot yesterday. I don't want to get into the specifics of how the sport works, but one of us has... Uh, I don't know, uh, I think a hurt or broken or whatever wrist, when your wrist doesn't work like it's supposed to, there's a different um, <clears throat> fighting style, basically, in Kendo. Mm -hmm. And that fighting style is way more offensive than the normal fighting style. And it's basically uh, one round in the chamber. You have one shot. If you don't get it, you're finished because you're mm -hmm. way too open and you're basically just lying on the floor. <laughs> Since he has uh, some condition with his wrist, uh, ha has to use this fighting style or is supposed to learn this fighting style so he can do the sport efficiently and effectively. Mm -hmm. But that fighting style also requires you to strike only with one hand. You have way less control over your sword, which meant that he several times, unfortunately, right? And no, it wasn't with um, intent. It was just because he has to learn this now, struck my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And in training, I noticed that I didn't feel my fingers anymore all of a sudden because my, my arm was just hanging to my left. And I was like, wait. This is not supposed, supposed to move. This is not supposed to work like this. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm still feeling the pain in my shoulder when I move my arm. So that was fun. Yeah, let's just say good thing you had armor and padding underneath. Oh, you don't have padding on your shoulders. No, no armor, nothing? No, why? why? That, it's, not a, it's not an area that is supposed to be struck. Ah, you okay. don't need mm -hmm. padding where you're not supposed to get hit. Yeah. I only yeah. need padding on my head, on my, uh, on my wrists. And mm -hmm. on my torso. Everywhere else is somewhat thick clothing. Yeah. Coming back to that, oh yeah, bro, I'm so fucking tough mentality. No, I think I could have taken, because the strikes weren't necessarily that hard. But it's just right. It's just not an area where I expected to get hit. Ah, and okay, then the sudden mm -hmm. realization shock of, oh, fuck, I got hit there. Yeah. Okay. It's just that in the moment, it's hurtful. And it's the same here. I just have a bruise on my shoulder now. But in the moment, it was like, oh, fuck, my fingers. Are they even still there? Mm. Ooh, <laughs> this hurts. <laughs> Right. And again, I have no hard feelings against the person because he was specifically instructed to do this. And if he doesn't, he just cannot do the sport like he wants to or like he should do. And mm -hmm. that would also be no fun. He has to learn this. And it's normal that when you are learning something, you do it wrong. And I admit that striking with only one instead of two hands is a lot harder. Uh, so, yeah, it yeah, happens. But... It's unfortunate that I got hit. But mm -hmm. it happens. But you gotta just push through, man. Yeah, you just gotta push through. <laughs> Bob, buy my cryptocurrency <laughs> NFT AI art. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> TTRPGs, bro. 
you probably did you have sessions already uh yes on tuesday actually one day after i got back i was more of a sitting there basically and listening and looking at what the other people did because my character was preoccupied with something else working in a forge and crafting a plate armor mm -hmm. and that took some time obviously but the others in in to use the time that i have to use to make this plate armor went around and were looking for work and then did that finding or trying to find a stolen piece of jewelry and yeah they are not really the sherlock holmes type <laughs> everyone <laughs> because the sherlock holmes type was sitting in the forge crafting yeah but but it was fun uh, we got a new player in uh, on that day in the testing phase is weird but the person never played D, &D before mm -hmm. so we got a completely new player at the table and just trying it out and seeing where it goes but it was a lot of fun still just okay. sitting there watching and making jokes about all the things that they might have missed or definitely did miss <laughs> turns out in the end they somehow managed to sign a magical contract of some sorts that's surely gonna go well yeah most definitely there's no problem at all with that it's definitely not co uh, coming back to bite us in the ass mm -mm. Mm -mm. it would never right can't never happened before never will happen the gm wouldn't do that oh, right no 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 yeah but that was my ttrpg week how about yours um well i had a session zero on tuesday um mm -hmm. that i won't talk about too much because it is a project that involves double dm things I won't have a session today. Uh, unfortunately, stuff gets in the way. Mm -hmm. I have a session on Friday with okay. you. Mm -hmm. And I also have two sessions on Sunday <laughs> <laughs> with you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I have a lot of stuff coming up. It's one D&D session, one actual play recording and a cyberpunk red session where you guys still have to infiltrate a nightclub to get the stolen object that was stolen from you guys back that we were supposed to steal but yeah didn't but kind of did but didn't you you stole the <laughs> you, you stole the um the red herring object yeah unfortunately which was very was fun 50 because 50, okay? because <laughs> you had you, you guys had the normal object for the entire time of the first adventure mm -hmm. and then lost it at the last minute through sheer bad luck and incompetence i could say and then just got home with the mock-up object where the others that had the wrong object the entire time got the right one mm -hmm. so but yeah that's just how it is sometimes sometimes it is how it is um and yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will see how that goes and i think we will talk about everything in that in those sessions the next time on Double DM, next week when we release an episode on I don't know what topic at all yet, so don't ask me. But now, let's get into our episode on the process of creating worlds and how to start creating your own world for TTRPGs. Hey listener, how are you enjoying the show so far? Tell us about it in whatever way you see fit. Go to our social media pages and add us or DM us about your favorite episode of the show. We would love to hear from you on what impact our show might have had on your home games. Or you could review us on your podcast app of choice and leave us a nice message with a five-star review. And if you want to go above and beyond, bring a friend into the fold. Tell them about our show and refer us to them so they can get a piece of the pie as well. Thank you for listening to Double DM and joining us on this incredible journey. So Emil, recently I had a session zero for a new campaign that one of my group is running where we now have basically everyone dm'd at one point mm -hmm. and and i love exploring new worlds that my friends made because who doesn't right mm -hmm. and that got me thinking it threw me back to when i designed my first world or started to mm -hmm. and that was something in general that i wanted to talk to you a bit about is mm -hmm. how we got started in world building itself and what we think about when we build our worlds and develop them or mm -hmm. how many worlds we've built so far and all of that so how did you get started in world building what was the first thing that you did when you uh, that you would consider world building it's a long story you could say let's go because the first world building i ever did was probably before ttrpgs even existed in my life 
I mean, who hasn't, as a kid, told stories with their friends about, I don't know, a dark wood where heroes conquer whatever evils, blah, 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 blah. Or horror stories around a campfire or stuff like that. I am very happy that TTRPGs found its way very early on in my life. As mm -hmm. early as me being 14 years old. That's nearly 10 years at this point. When this episode comes out, I'm 24 years old. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for a lot of people, this comes TTRPGs come a lot later, and they are a way to reconquer that imagination they had as a kid. For me, it was a catalyst to never lose that imagination. Right? I know mm -hmm. uh, when you hear a lot of stories, and right when we talk to people, most of the people we talk to on the show are older than us, and that's yeah. okay. And they have a lot of experience, but they also talk about how they got into TTRPGs in college or how they rediscovered the games in college because they forgot about them. They went on with their lives and then boom, they learned their laugh again. And then now, now they needed this. Now this creativity was needed in their life and they found it as a fond hobby, blah, blah, blah. I never, never lost that imagination. <laughs> it, it, it immediately transferred into TTRPGs for me. Hmm, amazing. And yeah, but the first world building I did for TTRPGs... The first time I really uh, GM'd a game myself, it was, I think it was the Dark Eye that I GM'd the first time for my family. Mm -hmm. And I used the pre-written world and basically added nothing to it. So that's mm -hmm. not world building, right? But then uh, I started DMing further and further and found a game called Contact. Long-time listeners of the show might know this game as it's a hate laugh from me. <laughs> <laughs> I really like what I built with the system with my friends, but the system itself is not the best in per personal opinion. Mm -hmm. And for that, obviously, there was some kind of alternate future Earth. And, and for the beginnings, I just used it. But then I added to it. Then I created something from it. I created something that was truly uniquely my own. I created an entire multiverse of different objects and things and creatures and people and places. That was not never written into the game, so that's definitely world building. Yeah, most definitely. But it still was building on something pre-made. But I think that that's where most of us start. Mm -hmm. Building on what was pre-made and then creating from that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the best way I can answer the question is with an alternate future Earth where a lot of fucked up shit happened. Mm -hmm. But aren't these the best catalysts for a weird and chaotic TTRPG session? A world where a lot of fucked up shit happens? Um, At least to some degree? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting question you propose, actually, because I feel like the more fucked up the world is, the more options you give to your players to do the fucked up shit they want. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, having a world that is not fucked up gives players... And even just as much a place to do the fucked up shit they want. Because in the one place, it feels normal to do the fucked up shit. And in the other place, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Two ends of a spectrum, basically, leading to somewhat the same outcome. Players doing fucked up shit. And that's interesting. And that's something where I think we should put a pin in that. Mm -hmm. That Because that is something that we need for this discussion, I think, a little bit later on. <laughs> Fair. So, Niels, how did you start? Well, mm -hmm. my way was a bit different than yours or my start. Mm -hmm. I started way before TTRPGs or way before I got into TTRPGs. It started for me through video games, basically. I don't remember what game I played, but I played some role-playing game and I loved exploring the lore and everything that was in the world. But I've always felt that there is something missing, some sort of explanations to all the weird things, right? So I started to write my own world just, just because. I wanted to control what what was going on or rather control the reasons why the uh, why the shit was going down or create stories that explain why things went down and therefore i just started writing when i don't know i was like 11 or 12 something along those lines and yeah from the perspective that i have now it was shit <laughs> because it, there was a lot of things contradicting themselves but because in that time i didn't care because i just wanted to write some something cool something interesting something fun mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily or isn't necessarily coherent in the world itself 
Mm-hmm. But nowadays, when I create my world or the world that I build upon, I try to keep it as consistent as possible or as coherent as possible without that much contradictions, just to have a yeah some sort of consistency that the world is bound by in some way, shape or form. Mm-hmm. But yeah, world building started for me just f- through a desire of knowing or wanting to know more and therefore the need to create it. Yeah, that, that, that's actually beautifully said, right? It's this desire to know more that makes us as humans try to either find out what the actual thing is, or in this instance, because there is no actual thing behind it, there is nothing you can explore. Mm-hmm. We have to make up our own. We have to explain it for us so it works. That's Very great. And I think taking that, my actual first personal own world, Hmm. where I didn't necessarily take someone else's work and made my own fan fiction for it, basically. Hmm. Even that being the world we are currently living in, the world in Earth orbiting the sun, is started still with that, uh, started the same way you did. Hmm. I took something from someone else and dismantled it so thoroughly that it could not have been seen anymore as something that was created once before by someone else. Mm -hmm. That was the world of Pathfinder. Mm, My setting for D&D was originally inspired by Pathfinder, especially Pathfinder Kingmaker, the video game. Because in that, you play a character that at some point becomes king or queen of a country, hence the name of the adventure path and the video game. And well, I created the character and was like, whoa, this is such a cool character. I want to write them as an NPC for my D&D games, Mm -hmm. but I need a world for them to live in. I need a place for the country they are queen of to exist in. Mm -hmm. And I took the country that I built from that, put it somewhere, and then started building a map around it. And that map has nothing to do with Pathfinder anymore. Mm-hmm. with the original setting of Pathfinder or with the setting that was used for the Pathfinder Kingmaker Adventure Path and the video game has mm-hmm. nothing to do with it. It's completely different. It's completely new. And well, one con- from one country became a landscape, a valley between two very big mountain ranges. From that, it became a continent with two very big kingdoms and empires on either side of that mountain range. From that became a need of, hmm, this all feels very much one terrain basically. So yeah, this all feels like Central Europe to me. Germany, Mm. France, right? From where I'm from. It's what I first built because just out of pure instinct. Now I need regions that are different. I need need a region that uh, is like just based on a geographical region level. I need a region that is cold. I need a region that is hot. I need a region that is whatever else, right? From that came a continent. From that came two continents. From that became several islands around this. From that became seven continents and thousand little islands. Mm -hmm. And from that bore a world map with, I think, at this point, 120 different nations on it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, (laughs) when you now look at the country that I made from the beginning, it is nothing like the Pathfinder country anymore. I completely changed and rearranged it to fit what I need. The only thing, the only thing that is still the same is the name. Mm -hmm. But I think that's exactly the beauty of building your own world is that you can add and change and make it the way that you want it to or that fits the thing that you want to do in the first place even though it might change with time because it's not a creation of someone else but it's entirely your own you can do whatever the fuck you want if you want a country right inside a mountain or a kingdom go for it why the fuck not right in my experience this is the most fun for me using something that you have built at some point and then just adding towards it adding something around it and therefore creating the world organically through the interactions that you want to explore or Mm -hmm. want to have and therefore needing the other part that it interacts with Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and therefore just building and building and building on top of everything that you've just or that you've already built Mm -hmm. but i feel like right there is this meme of um how gms build every thing the plot and the world for the characters to interact with and this is it's just this train never stopping and then someone building the tracks right in front of the train right so the Mm -hmm. train never stops but it's just barely right just barely for the train to keep moving the meme is uh, right there's a reason it's a meme and because that's because there is some truth to it just like legends which is another thought you can think about that memes might become the legends of the 21st century (laughs) um (laughs) that's a meme but it has some truth in it and that 
that's because we build what we want to build. Hmm. And either we build something that we want to build because we just want to build it, or because we as GMs and world builders are made to build it because that's what currently is being called for by either exactly. story, players, or whatever else. Mm -hmm. So we build what we need to build. And that's something that we can talk about in a bit. Let's put a second pin mm -hmm. there. But first, I wanted to ask you, Niels, before we get to the actual process of expanding our world, mm -hmm. we've talked about what worlds we've built and how we've built them. But what's the first condensed step in creating a world? And what can people do to maybe lay groundwork for later stages already in the beginning? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest step to take is coming up with an idea. It might sound stupid, but if you don't have an idea, you can't build shit. Mm -hmm. And grabbing all the inspiration that you want to see where it all might be going or not, or just start with a vibe. It doesn't really matter as long as you have an idea what you want to do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be completely formulated or it doesn't have to be specific. Just mm -hmm. I want to build a middle European or central European world or country. Then start there. Start wherever your mind takes you mm -hmm. and then see what you want to do and build upon this idea and develop that idea. Mm -hmm. And basically for every step of the world itself, you need to repeat that process. Come up with something mm -hmm. that you want to do, have a rough idea of what you want to do, and then develop that idea. Mm -hmm. This is usually the way yeah. I go uh, go about yeah. it. Just having a spark that then spreads to a, uh, to a fire and then just leaves something beautiful behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, feel, I feel like that's a very great metaphor. Go with whatever you currently have on your mind. If you have on your mind that um, I don't know, you're currently in a position in your job where you are looking for a promotion and there might be one right around the corner and as dumb as it sounds if that's what's currently on your mind and you want to take a few hours away from it and start world building and now the idea comes that maybe there's some kind of job in your world that doesn't exist yet where promotions are handled this and this way mm -hmm. if that's your spark then that's your spark exactly you never know what your spark is the only thing you can do once you have a spark is fan the flames yeah embrace the spark but now i'm gonna add something to that yes mm -hmm. ending Niels's answer perfect <laughs> Think of your world on whatever level you're on, be that on the physical map level, be that on the people level that live in your world, be that on the whatever level. Think of your world always as a puzzle. Oh, I love that. And every time you add something, it's a puzzle piece. And a puzzle piece can only work if the puzzle pieces that it connects to work with it. Yeah, I love so that. So if you create something for your world, how to lay the groundwork for later stages is to make this puzzle piece itself a contained artwork. I'm mm -hmm. going to call it art because world building is an art form. Oh, yeah. And if is. you are creating a world, it is art. It is a self-contained thing. It works in itself most of the time at least, mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form. But there are a lot of outstanding factors that influence it. The same goes for other things that are connected to it. It influences other things as well. Mm -hmm. If, for example, you have a country that is, um, like for example, take your promotion thing. The promotion is only given to, so you're writing an academy. A magical academy, but the promotion is only given to someone who can withstand the divination council's test, where basically they just look into your future to see if you are destined to do bright things with the promotion you're getting. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's a self-contained thing. But there's a country around this divination academy. It is needed that this academy creates mages that are uh, sent out to service something else. Mm -hmm. right? The country itself is a country of mages. It's, it's a mageocracy. It's yeah. a mage atop a throne. And he needs the brightest minds to keep his country standing in the world. So the promotion would only go to the brightest minds. Yeah. And he needs a, a sure way to find out what, 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 what better way to look into the future of the person and see what they are destined to do. Mm -hmm. Now you have created two puzzle pieces. The academy itself and the country and the leader, theoretically, so three within that country, or within yep. that academy lies. So now you have built from a spark, from a random spark that you had, a fire that has become an artwork, a puzzle piece for you to add to it. And you have to mm -hmm. think of this puzzle piece as a fifth dimen five dimensional puzzle. There can always be more points where something can attach to something. There's, mm -hmm. there's no limitations of that 
dimensions of physical physicality. But that's the advice for creating great worlds, in my opinion. From beginnings early on, make sure that everything you create works together with other things. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it just doesn't. Yeah, or at least have something where other parts can interact with. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily need to, or at least in my opinion, not necessarily need to work with everything mm -hmm. in so or, I, or with anything, as long as there are points where other things can interact with. Yeah, and leave an openness to it. Yeah, right. exactly. It alone might be already beautiful, mm -hmm. but it can always add to the beauty of something greater. Exactly. Be that in the actual game that it, that it adds to something or that it just is there and uh, mm -hmm. is kind of like a background supporting thing. Yeah. Uh, one of the first puzzle pieces in that instance, uh, sticking with that metaphor, because I love that, that I try to build is um, usually how the physics or the sciences in general or natural forces or whatever work in uh, just as in thing of what I do, because mm -hmm. I love it when in my fantasy worlds, there is still a lot of real realism in some ways mm -hmm. in it, because that en just enhances the fantastical options for me. It's just a personal experience thing the more grounded it is in realism mm -hmm. the brighter the fantasy shines and that's what i'm here for oh i love that because if you don't have gravity working the same way as it works in uh, in our instance mm -hmm. flying magic isn't as impressive yeah but if you know that everything falls back down to the ground everything except the ones that have worked with flying magic, mm -hmm. they don't. So this is still something extraordinary. Even in a world where all of this exists, these are still some things that not everyone can do or still defy the natural laws. Mm -hmm. And this is something, as a, a student in a nature science field, it's still something that's not necessarily always on my mind, but a lot of the times I still think about some sort of physical laws and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's always this spark of how does this thing interact with the world itself and why and then trying to explain that but not necessarily in a mathematical way but more in a yeah it works because of reason x and then building upon that that yeah but it works this way except when reason z happens or something like that mm -hmm, just to mm -hmm. connect basically have amorphous puzzle puzzle pieces that then lay the groundwork for every puzzle piece on top Mm -hmm. Th that's something that I usually start with. Yeah. But just as a personal preference, you can start with the top layer and just uh, you don't have to do any sort of... That's the thing about world building, I feel. It's unique to everyone. Mm -hmm. That's why, sentimental uh, thing here, that's why we started doing Wire World Matches with Jason Zollinger and uh, Steam Sage. Mm -hmm. Because everyone is different. But everyone is creative. Yeah. That's a based fact. Mm -hmm. We are all creative in some way. But everyone is different. People create their worlds differently. People use their worlds differently. People think about their worlds differently. So it's always amazing to hear from other people how they start, how they do something. And if you have the specific opinion that you need to start with a town inside a forest each and every time, then you do that. Yeah. There's nothing bad about it. There's nothing good about it. That It's just there. It's exactly. your style and you're the one that is in full control here. And I think that's why we love world building so much mm -hmm. as people it is our full control at least to some level right we can mm -hmm. always talk about how the gm shouldn't always be 100 in control because he has players or they have players but regardless it is something that we control mm -hmm. in a world where a lot of factors are outside of our control creative writing world building is just a way to escape and create something that we want something that we want to have something that we want to see mm -hmm. something that is truly ourselves yeah. something that is true to ourselves um and that's why no one can tell you how to do it we can just th that's why this episode is so we can we are only here to discuss how we are doing it and give you some ideas for some things that you want to do but if you for example disagree with my puzzle tip it doesn't change the fact that your world could still be the most beautiful thing ever for you exactly we're just here to maybe produce a spark that then turns into the beautiful thing that you want to do yeah or, or we're giving or you not. the fan to fan the yeah, flames exactly but the way the fan is used or the way the the flames are burning is still for you yeah, okay enough not metaphors here to tell for you the day. how to build a fucking <laughs> forge <laughs> enough to enough for, of the metaphors <laughs> for today it's still is so important to understand that world building is uniquely for you. Yeah. And when you own that fact, this is my world. This is what I created. 
or even this is what we created mm. as a group. This is our world. Owning that fact allows you to disregard everything that you thought was needed for worlds. And th that's one thing that we can look at. Like Niels just said, most of his worlds, or basically all of his worlds, still have gravity. Mm. Probably all of them, right? Yeah. Because Niels as a person is so heavily ingrained with living with gravity that he just cannot imagine a world without it. Mm. But he can. Yeah. He could create a world without gravity. He could create a world without whatever he wants. It is his prerogative to do whatever he wants. And owning the fact that you can do that allows you to disregard everything that you thought was needed. Mm -hmm. You don't need forests in your world if you say so. In general, you don't need anything if you don't want it. That's the beauty. You can build whatever you want just because you want it to be. Yeah. And, and this is one of the reasons why I love world building so much because it's just a creative outlet for me to write something down that floats around in my head, which is a lot at some point <laughs> or at some times. <laughs> but it's also, just as you said, it's a form of release. Yeah. World building is a form of release for a lot of people. You, you have a stressful day at work, eight hours of, uh, of a painful job that you have to do to survive in our hellscape capitalist society. And then you get home and you just decide, ah, I have, some, have that fun idea for a little pixie that lives in a forest. So let's just write a pixie forest. Yeah. And then you write a pixie forest into your world or somewhere onto your paper, onto a piece of paper or into your notes somewhere. It doesn't matter. The act of doing it alone is already worth it. It doesn't have to be used in a world. I will tell you here right now, the act of doing it made it worth. And that's the reward in world building for me. Yeah. After you've done it or while you're doing it even you've done something or do something that is just simply beautiful and creative and amazing and incredible. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to mention in that instance is a, a, a quote by mm -hmm. one of the most respected world builders I know. One person that I respect as a world builder. Uh, S. Kaya J. Mirrorlock on Twitter once said on an episode of Reckless A Talk, and I think at some other points as well, but that's where I remember it from, do you enjoy the act of doing or having done? More or less. Ooh, that's an interesting question. Though. And for world building, you can always ask yourself that question. Is it about having done the thing or is it about doing the thing? For me personally, I would say both. It can always be both. Yeah. But I think the thing is that for Kaya, this was obviously made to about projects. You should enjoy the process of doing something, not just having done the thing. That was the original quote, more or less. Mm -hmm. I used it a little bit for this discussion because, right, obviously we can always use what we just did and enjoy the, uh, enjoy the process of having done it so we can now use it. But I think for world building, it's way more important to enjoy the doing of it because that mm -hmm. is the only way you can create something Thing that is truly what you want to create. Yeah, and I think that this is one uh, one really important point is that as long as you put passion into your project, into your world, no matter how it turns out, it will always be perfect for you because yeah. you had fun and um, just enjoyed the process itself mm. and not just, yeah, I need to get this done so I can use it. Then I personally would advise you to go with a world that already exists and then play in it. But as long as you have that drive to create something of your own, most of the time you like the process of creating itself yeah. itself. So mm -hmm. yeah, amazing. Passion is a big thing. Yeah, one thing about that, though. We talked about the fact that this meme where uh, the GM is just putting tracks in front of a moving train to keep it going and that you should not do something that you currently don't want to do and only do what you want to do. These two parts kind of clash when you think about it at first. Mm -hmm. Your players enter a new area. You have no idea what this area is supposed to be. Maybe you have some broad strokes. It's a city. That's all you know. It's a big city. Mm -hmm. And you have currently no creative energy to write a city. But you have a session in two weeks. What do we do about that? Now, except, Nils, I know that the one of the best things to say would be to cancel the session. Mm -hmm. Maybe, right? I am currently not feeling creative enough to actually create something you guys would like. Can we skip next week's session or something? Yes, is an option. But mm -hmm. for the sake of this discussion, it's yeah. a cop out. Yeah, for, for that uh, situation, if you don't want to cancel, which I can totally understand uh, as itself as well. I is, hate canceling um, my own sessions, even yeah. though sometimes I need it. Just yeah. because TTRPGs are my stress relief. Leave, and if I lose it, I have too much stress. <laughs> exactly. But I think in that instance, I would say keep it generic, kind of. Do what you 
need to do mm -hmm. to get done or get over with it, not get over that. Do the bare minimum. Do the bare minimum and create that what you need to create necessarily. Everything else will fall into place anyways. And a lot of times, I, this happened to me so a couple of times, where my party advanced faster than I anticipated. And I just know, okay, there will be a mining town. That's all I knew. Then I said, yeah, okay, you enter the mining town. There is no um, town sign, how it is named or something uh, along those lines. And just created on the spot, yes, but the bare minimum of what is needed so the session can pro uh, pro um, continue. Mm -hmm. And then after the fact, after my players interacted with the place itself, I got inspiration from that. Because just seeing people interact, even with the bare minimum that you have, be it boilerplate NPC 2 in that city gives you in a lot of cases the inspiration that you need to create the thing that you want to create for that mm -hmm. at least in my personal experience <laughs> yeah do the bare minimum is a great advice in my opinion because you don't have to do more you can always lean on your players for mm -hmm. example right now um, my players are planning um i don't know how much i think i can say everything about it basically one of my players is a warlock of a demon he wants to change that and become the warlock of a god mm -hmm. and we created a chapter for of our story together for him to get that uh, there's different stages to it but stage one is find out what how the pact was actually made Mm -hmm. They are doing that through a ritual into the subconscious of this character. Oh, damn. He's a drow, so he comes from the Underdark. And I currently have no energy to prep or world build my Underdark. Mm -hmm. But do you know what I have? Players. Exactly. And I told exactly. two of them, the one this chapter's about, and another person, the ranger character, you both have been to the Underdark. You have a little bit of control in telling me what you know about the Underdark. And when in a session, one of them says, well, hey, GM, in my time in the Underdark, um, I've known that there are glowing mushrooms down here that one can use as lambs. And I say, yeah, sure. Make a nature check. Boom, you find them. And instantly, I've world built an interesting detail to my underdark. Mm -hmm. Even though my underdark um, is only dark and underground. I don't yeah. need more. I'm not saying that you always have to lean on your players. But I'm saying that you always can and you always should, in mm -hmm. at least to some degree. Yeah. They are part of this world too. Mm -hmm. And if and, and what at the end, we as DMs, I'm gonna say it the way it is. I GM because I want to provide my friends an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. What amazing experience can I provide them with engaging with what they find cool and amazing? Exactly. If and they come up with an idea that they find cool, yes, it exists in mm -hmm. that instance. And I will break another puzzle piece for it to work. Yeah. Because it is a better puzzle piece. Yeah. Something similar to your story has happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> One of my characters, also a draw, wanted to go back home because of some reason. But I haven't prepped the Underdark like whatsoever. I just know that this character came from a city in the Underdark. So I know, hey, there needs to be cities. It's at least one. And then I just told the player, hey, how do you want to uh, your city to feel? How do you want your uh, city to look? Just that alone. Then he gave me the vibes that the city uh, should give off. And then I just bullshitted my way around. We each bounced ideas off each other. We basically mm. world built this part together. And we came up with the city called the Nameless City. Mm -hmm. Where, yes, there live Drow and Duriga, mostly, but they still kind of simulate a day and night cycle with glowing mushrooms in on a pillar in the middle of the city. It isn't as bright as sunlight, obviously, but mm -hmm. still that you have a working biorhythm. We, we both wanted that. So you have still morning, midday and night. So we just did it. And now it's part of the world and everyone loved it mm -hmm. because just it is just a point of interaction that two people agreed upon would be amazing and the others didn't know about anyways. And then they just got plunged into the unknown, basically, <laughs> and got to experience or explore everything that they don't know yet. Mm -hmm. But with one person coming from that location, knowing everything about it that they wanted to know. So mm -hmm. that's the thing. It's amazing if you lean on your players and they provide you with everything you could have hoped for and more because in 99.9% .9 of the time they will just because they <laughs> like their character and are invested in them. Yeah, but I also want to say that if you can't lean on your players in that 1% instance where your players don't have an idea or you maybe for whatever reason don't uh, want to lean on your players because you don't want to stress them anymore with uh, being the creative person that comes up with ideas on the spot because some people just aren't like that. Mm -hmm. And if your players are like that, that's okay. Totally. Uh, you also don't have to be that as a GM. You don't need a cre necessarily spot-on improvising creative 
creative person at the table to play a game. Fuck no. You just mm -hmm. need people that are willing to play. That's all you need. And if you're willing to play, uh, you will find a way to make it work. But if you're completely creatively drained, which can happen, burnout is real. And please take care of yourself if you are realizing that you're currently not able to write. Writer's block is a serious thing. Take a step away. Wait two days. Do it again. Try again if you even want to try again. Or wait for the next spark. But you have a session. Go with what you know. Go with what your muscle memory tells you. And this can be a scary advice for new GMs because you don't you have not perfected the muscle memory to GM yet. Yeah, about kind, that. You kind of <laughs> do. Because go with what you know is not necessarily doing what you as a GM know to do and doing everything. But for example, Neil's example of the mining town. Do mm -hmm. you know what um, if I don't have, I currently don't necessarily have it in me today to create NPCs. I, have, I did so yesterday and I have a plan for a few NPCs that I want to create tomorrow, for example. But today I've ca just come out of four and a half hours of recording, mm. doing this extra hour of recording and also editing today. So I'm completely creatively drained on this Sunday. <laughs> Yeah, that we're recording on. But I have a few basic NPCs that I can just throw in because that's what I perfected, more mm -hmm. or less. Perfected is, is a little bit of a strong word. <laughs> that's what you've learned. It, it feels like you. boasting, but it isn't. Yeah, yeah, the, not necessarily perfected, but that is something that you've learned and works for you. It, it yeah. is through the uh, games that you've played, you perfected it in the sense that it does everything that you needed to do. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. I think talking about that, you don't necessarily need to come up with every single part of any NPC all the time to call it perfect. Yeah. Just as long as you come up with enough things to make it work, that's perfect already. Yeah. That, that's just something I wanted to say to that. It's important to say. But Neil said Mining Town. Do you know what my first thought was? Um, even though I don't necessarily have that much of a creative idea, it's just because because I like the character. Hit me. Crazy prospector with dynamite. <laughs> Perfect. I, I love right? it. <laughs> right? or, or even just crazy old dude. Mm -hmm. Your players enter the mining town. There is no name. There is no. There, it's just a mining town, a few houses. You describe nothing really about it. Mm -hmm. And then you just say, well, there sits an old man on one of the porches. And when he sees you, he goes, new people. Hello. <laughs> that character doesn't come from creativity for me. It comes from my players just love these characters that I do with these very weird voices. Mm -hmm. So I do them often. And it's what I know. I don't need to know anything about about the character. I don't need to improvise. That's everything. Yeah, the rest comes when my players necessarily ask for it and I have to improvise it. Yeah, um, d d don't ask me how many grumpy, old, but in a deep in heart friendly smiths I made just because <laughs> that's my go-to for when your players smith ask NPC. for a new smith. Yeah. Yeah. I then know it. I just, yeah, okay, that's Ruger Ironjaw, the grumpy old smith that has a heart of gold. Okay, cool. How many Ruger Ironjaws I've made? One, actually, but a lot of <laughs> iterations of that. But, but it doesn't <laughs> but it doesn't matter, right? Because exactly. e even for your players, um, your, your world, th this is maybe important, your world doesn't have to be the most fucking original piece of art ever conceived by anyone. Mm. We can say that there's only seven types of stories. So, and since every type of story has been written at least once, you can always say that your story is just a reiteration of any other story that you've conceived before. Sure, your story might have original ideas, but on the basis level, it's still a basic hero's journey or exactly. a basic whatever the fuck. And the same goes for worlds. Sure, mm. your worlds are, as we said, your worlds are beautiful because you created them and because you are creating them. But that doesn't mean that your worlds need to be the most original thing ever. You don't need to think for every place, everything, every person that your players interact with, that it has to be the most original thing that they've encountered. Basic normality is also needed to highlight the original ideas that you have. If you are a big Lord of the Rings nerd, I encourage you to make your fantasy very Lord of the Rings-like mm -hmm. and then place your interesting ideas in that realm that you've created using the Lord of the Rings logic. Yeah. Because that makes your ideas, the ones that you have, the one special things that you have, stand out. Yeah. And this is something that I think a lot of people fear is to take inspiration because they might think this might be plagiarism and blah, 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 blah. It is completely normal to take inspiration and build upon that with your own ideas. You don't have to come up with any uh, with everything on your own. Just take the ideas itself and not necessarily the place names or whatever or character names or Heck, even them. Name one of your country's Hyrule for the fuck I give. Yeah. That would I, be fun as fuck. Just saying yeah, it. No one cares. 
just use what makes you happy in that yeah. regard. You use what works for you. If it works for you to use the layout of white run for one of your trading towns, do that. Why the fuck not? Who gives a shit? If right? you have a castle in the mountains and you name it Kermorhen and basically pull the map from Witcher 3, I won't bet an eye. I would say, oh my god, this is fucking amazing. Players love recognizing the stuff that you've pulled from other games. At the beginning, it sounds very much like these players are saying, ha, I recognize where you took that from. You did the bad job of hiding it. No. No one no. will do that. Well, maybe some assholes. Yeah, but, but the players that you want to play with <laughs> will mostly say, oh my God, this is so amazing because I, right, I've played The Witcher. It's my favorite video game of all time. This mm -hmm. is amazing. Yes. Yes. It's again, we always assume you play in good faith. So we have to. Yeah. Well, without that, we just say, yeah, okay, then there are assholes. But that's out of the picture. Mm -hmm. And the amount of times that I've made a reference to some sort of video game series or whatever and my players caught it and thought was oh my lord was that amazing i did not see that coming and then i just delighted because they know what they want to or should feel or want to feel or how they feel about that uh, specific reference mm -hmm. just because i like the way it is presented in this movie this show or this video game that works for my world is basically immeasurable because <laughs> i pick and choose whatever the fuck i want <laughs> and just put it in my campaign or in my worlds just to make a fun region that I can resonate with that works for me because as soon as I write down the reference that I had or the inspiration for that place or that NPC or whatever I instantly know the feel that I wanted to have for that because I think this is a lot of uh, or a big thing that a lot of people overlook at some point is that you don't necessarily need a detailed description of everything that you've done uh, that is there you don't need to describe every crack and every stone of that castle as long as you get the vibe across that it should get across mm -hmm. if you want to have a castle ruined you don't need to say how many towers are fallen in with how many stones still standing yeah just as long as you get the vibe hey it's a ruined castle someone lived here and it was humongous but now it's in disrepair and completely destroyed that's fucking enough yeah yeah if you want to build uh, if you want to build more go for it but you don't have to to get everything across that you need to the vibe yeah. of itself because the imagination as i always say is an amazing tool mm -hmm. and in the end if you describe or the less you describe the more the mind of the person hearing it fills in mm -hmm. and then fits to the or building some or the mind builds something that fits the description or the yeah. energy or the vibe that this yeah. description just gave off yeah. And this is way more highly defined than any description you could ever give. In Depending, most cases. exactly, yeah. <laughs> in most cases. Aphantasia is the thing as well. No, but th that's the thing, right? Um, you just need to make sure that there's enough areas for your players to connect to so they can fill in the blanks themselves. And we've said this before, we talked about cornerstones and prepping and then world building. Have these cornerstones for your location. It's a ruined mm -hmm. castle. Maybe there are still some banners or something, some things that you just regard as facts mm -hmm. and the rest doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it has stables or not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter because if your players say, does it have stables? Because we have, we, we currently have our horses and maybe if we, because we are hunkering down here for the night in this ancient abandoned castle. Oh, I don't, uh, don't sense a horror one shot coming or something. Um, <laughs> I just going to write that down real quick after the session, <laughs> by the way. But does it have stables so we can park our horses here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, why not? It has stables. And they are at least to some degree not in the uh, okay enough for you to do that. Mm -hmm. The stables didn't have to exist before that question. Yeah. And they don't have to exist much more after the question, just for the fact that they are, that you answered the question. So, yeah, <laughs> that's basically passive world building. And I think mm -hmm. you can rely on passive world building a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you can. There's one thing else I want to talk about before I get to the thing that where, where we put the pin in exactly early on in the episode. And this that thing is, Niels, how often do you create new worlds? Oh, um... And I'm talking whatever you regard as world, but how often would you say you are starting a new world? Not that often. I think after my first world that went batshit crazy, <laughs> I started two. Mm -hmm. One that was in the, or is still in the making of 
building some weird shit and but i have paused for quite some time and then the one that i mostly play in now but mm -hmm. i started with one country and then built upon that because i like to build more mm -hmm. upon the things that i already have than completely start anew mm -hmm. most of the time at some points I, li i like to write down ideas or sparks for mm -hmm. new worlds but i don't necessarily build upon them as long as i don't have the insane spark that just started a wildfire basically that i need to write down now mm -hmm. because i have exactly two distinct worlds right now mm -hmm. one of them is my world min mm -hmm. or no i have three theoretically now i have min which is my fantasy catch-all world with that where i can play basically everything that fits the fantasy ttrpg genre mm -hmm. i have the world of titan's call because i said i explicitly don't want to make titan's call part of min because i want titan's call to be a contained story and And subjecting it to the things that I've already written for Min wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So that was needed. But that was only born out of necessity for Titan's Call to be its own thing. Mm -hmm. If Titan's Call wouldn't have been an actual play, it wouldn't have been a new world. It would have been a Min. Yeah. But there's a lot of baggage acclaimed to Min that I don't want to subject an audience to. And then three, the Helllands. A wild west inspired demonic apocalypse setting. Oh damn, nice. So yeah. Those are the three settings I have. And I and I know people, some people build their worlds for each and every campaign. They build a new world. Mm -hmm. You can do that. You can also just take one world and host every campaign in it. Mm -hmm. Even if some people might say, well, then your worlds are always playing after the same rules. They are always in the same world, right? Somewhat. Because mm -hmm. one thing that is important, world building And now I'm pulling the pin out of the thing that I put the pin in. World building serves play in the context of TTRPGs. Oh, yeah. It doesn't command it and it doesn't dictate it. It serves play. Mm -hmm. So if your world, if you if you write for one campaign in your world, you write into your one world an archmage that can do everything, basically, because you need him to be the BBEG. And you have another campaign in that game where that would be destructive. Well, you have a thousand different options of making that archmage disappear the easiest being they don't exist mm -hmm. nothing else changes just exactly. that that one puzzle piece is now gone its void can be filled or not even be filled you have full control but you need to realize that world building in the context of ttrpgs explicitly serves play and players and that's where that came in that we were talking about in the beginning either your world's completely fucked up and allows players to do the fucked up shit because that makes it normal to do the fucked up shit or it is completely normal and allows players to do the fucked up shit they want to do because that would then be fucked up because yeah. it is then special. Both work. And from that you can realize that there's a complete disconnect between the world you have and the play that happens in that world. Exactly. At least on a meta level. Mm -hmm. It is still influencing each other, obviously. But at the end of the day, your world should not dictate how play goes. Exactly. Or at least the, the, not at least the, to, to, yeah. to the big degree. Sure, mm -hmm. you, your players cannot fly because my world has gravity. But, but we're talking about more specific things here mm. and i think especially the the way that you created the world shouldn't influence yeah the play itself yeah. the world yes the play itself no mm. if you want to make that distinction which i think is important because depending on um how you create your world the world obviously differs but it shouldn't matter how you create the world that um or how you create the world shouldn't influence the way you play mm -hmm. because you still want to play a game that is way more important than eh, but this world this wouldn't work because i build it that way no don't care <laughs> i don't care does it make sense for the story that the archmage is not there yeah okay so the archmage isn't there fuck off but yeah yeah i world think building man i love that world building is amazing and you should do it in the description of this episode they will find links to the why your world matters panels that we have done that you can listen to or watch i don't know if you can watch them anymore and also i will put a link to the most uh, respected world builder i know kaya uh, on twitter because her world builders almanac is set to release at some point this year and i urge you to pick it up for you to make your world building even better And with that, I have nothing else to talk about. Me neither. So thank you all for listening. See you on the next one and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Double DM. It appears you liked this one. What we had to say and our advice helped you. Why not show us how we helped you in a rating? Or even write a review detailing us how we helped. You can do this on the platform that you are listening on right now. 
It's just a few clicks, doesn't take long and helps us out. It gets us out there and our advice into more ears of more people. Thanks again for listening and joining us on this amazing journey. Have a great day and see you on the next one. Bye bye.